All right, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Dr. Michael Twyman, for those that don't know me, I'm a board certified cardiologist, a biohacker, health optimizer, and uh, now a uh, more expert on COVID than I ever really wanted to be. Um, so I'll share whatever knowledge I know tonight and um, you know, definitely open up to Q and A for whatever you guys want to know about. So I got this uh, streaming on three things, so I'll uh, hit all the questions as they come. Um, I'm gonna keep you guys muted for just now on the, here on Zoom, just so I can go through a couple things. But um, don't have any major agenda tonight. You know, um, and definitely can hit upon COVID. You know, definitely talk about heart attack stroke prevention because that's still my area of expertise, and been doing that 100% uh, of the time since uh, August when I launched Apollo Cardiology. Uh, right now, it's all telemedicine based. And if you're my current patient or want to be a patient, you know, just contact me, let Cassidy know, and we'll get you booked, and we'll set up a Zoom call and uh, go through your info and get you on the right path. So, so honestly, um, I'm a little bit uh, overdone on reading about COVID. Um, I don't think too much really happened today, at least in the St. Louis area. Um, we got some friends in New York uh, on Instagram, and it's still absolutely insane in New York right now. You know, then the number one concern still is just the overwhelming uh, the ICUs in the medical capacity, and definitely New York is a blessing at the seams. You know, the, uh, the Navy uh, ship, the Comfort, is uh, rolled into New York Harbor today, and I think they're going to start seeing people as soon as tomorrow. They're going to take the non-COVID patients um, just to offload a little bit of the work from the hospital. Um, St. Louis is still probably one to two weeks away from the big surge of uh, patients. You know, St. Louis is doing a great job with the hospital systems, Mercy, SSM, uh, BJC and uh, St. Luke's are all uh, very well uh, coordinated. Uh, there's respiratory center cares in St. Louis. So, you know, my brother's a uh, paramedic in town. You know, basically, like if you call in with COVID type symptoms, uh, unless you're, you know, respiratory arrest or into the hospital, you're going to one of these respiratory centers screened. And then if they need be, uh, then they'll send you on to the hospital. As I've been telling you before, you know, the hospital is about the last place in the world you want to go right now. It's mostly the viral load of the virus that's the biggest problem, uh, especially for the younger people. You know, this is not a, a disease of just the, the elderly or the uh, immunocompromised. You know, the younger you are, the worse your redox potential is, the energy your mitochondria make, which we can talk about a little bit if you like. And if you didn't see my video on Friday, you can do the, uh, how to build your redox potential and uh, all these uh, laser you know, watches and gadgets and stuff I have to, to build your redox potential. But, those with poor redox potential, they're more prone to getting this virus. And the reason that the healthcare workers are uh, getting a big uh, um, surge of infections themselves, and I think in like Italy, it was like 8% of the healthcare workers were infected. Um, it might have been even more than that. It's that this repeated viral loads that these people are getting exposed to. So, you know, if you just go to the grocery store and you walk by somebody who got COVID and, you know, they sneezed on you, hey, that's not cool. But if you're, you know, ER doc, an anesthesia doc, you got 20, 30 of these patients a day doing that on you, you just get repeated exposures and your viral loads go extremely high. <clears throat> and then they probably have more of an issue where their immune system is so robust and they're getting more of a cytokine storm. So their body's, you know, fighting the virus off, but in the process, a lot of things are getting damaged. So it's always a balance between uh, the immune system uh, beating the virus and not beating you up too much. That's essentially what happened in 1918 flu is that really healthy people died more than young people and older people because their immune systems were so much more robust. That doesn't seem to be the case totally in this instance, but a little bit in the healthcare workers maybe. Um, <clears throat> I still haven't seen any great uh, data on um, you know, optimal treatment once you're actually sick. You know, it's still mainly supportive care. Uh, you hopefully don't end up on a ventilator. Uh, ending up on a ventilator is uh, bad news. Um, you know, I think in this case scenario, maybe 30% of people are getting off the ventilator, um, and it's taking two to three weeks or more on the ventilator to do that. So that's the big concern is that they're going to run out of ventilators before uh, people recover. Um, I haven't looked at the data too recently, but I think at max, there's about 170,000 ventilators in the U.S. I know GM and you know, Tesla and even Dice and the vacuum cleaner guy have some models that they're going to try to put together soon. Cool, but you know, great, we have more ventilators. Um, it's still, we don't have enough people to run those ventilators. You know, I haven't run an event personally by myself since about 2005. I played around with a little bit, but uh, 
you know, if you don't want the respiratory therapist to cut your hand off, uh, you better know what you're doing uh, using the ventilators. And you know, the best estimates I've seen so far, there's about 100,000 people, ICU trained doctors, nurses, critical care anesthesia people that would know how to man all these things. You know, they're going to get overwhelmed soon, especially in New York, likely soon in California. So this is the whole reason for the, you know, stay at home orders, the quarantines is that if we can quote flatten the curve, still maybe 40 to 70% of people are going to get infected, but it's over a longer period of time, they're not going to get completely overwhelmed by ICUs. You know, some reports, you know, we probably overwhelm ICUs by 3x their capacity, but if we did absolutely nothing and just went on as planned, there's reports that we were going to 30x the capacity of the ICU. So even if you have something that isn't COVID related, you know, I'm a cardiologist, um, I don't know, you know, how bad it's going to be. I'm sure the data will come out, you know, when all things are said and done, but I'm sure heart attacks are going to have a significant bump in mortality um, because people aren't going to be able to get the care as fast as it was before COVID. Um, there's already reports of people coming in with STEMIs, which would be normally a very um, acute emergency. You go straight from EMS, usually bypass the ER, and go straight to the cath lab. You know, symptoms of a STEMI can be just chest pain, choice of breath, and abnormal EKG. There's already numerous cases that people are taking these people to the cath lab, they're shooting the coronary arteries, they have no blockages, and turns out they were COVID positive. So now the whole cath lab team got exposed to COVID potentially. And you know, they're spending two to three hours having to decon the rooms. So um, there's talks of using more fibrinolytics with these type of cases. So basically giving clot buster drugs instead of trying to activate the cath lab for everything. So this is the concern is that if they overwhelm the medical system, even if you're coming in with a emergency that isn't related to COVID, your care may suffer. So the better you can stay at home, the better everybody does. <clears throat> you know, prevention, that's gonna be the stuff that myself and I know Dr. Lyon was on here before, we've been talking about, you know, it's dealing with your stress, optimal nutrition, optimal exercise, and sleep. And sleep being really the, probably the most important before, you know, when you sleep is when you boost your immune system, your um, cytokines are improved, your T regulator cells are more optimized. So it's not necessarily the number of hours of sleep you get, it's the quality of sleep. So you should feel well rested the next day. You know, you know, when you are sick, you know, when you're sleeping nine, 10 hours a day, that's your body telling you, you need that rest to recover. So build up that recovery now if you have the option. You know, a lot of us have a lot of down plan or a lot of plan downtime right now. You know, this isn't the time to just goof off and watch uh, the Tiger King. You know, the Tiger King is awesome. If you haven't seen the Tiger King, watch the Tiger King. But um, other than watching the Tiger King, get out there, exercise every day, keep your body healthy, get your sleep, and then stress. Stresses can be ubiquitous during this time, everybody. You know, it's just how well do you deal with it? You know, so mindfulness meditation, you know, uh, I've been a meditator for, you know, three, four years, it helped me tremendously. I see my uh, brother-in-law in here, his wife's a certified meditation teacher, she made meditation, you know, raps, you know, Headspace did that for many years until I got used to using, you know, other techniques. Um, but meditation is useful, yoga, probably going to be home yoga for right now. Um, but another thing I really like for stress relief is heart math. I made by a company called Interbalance, clips to your ear, measures heart rate variability. That's the B2B difference of your heartbeats. The better you can control your heart rate variability, the better your uh, sympathetic tone, your fight or flight response has been controlled. So talking about that. And then for nutrition, just basically don't mix up things too much. You know, keep doing what you're normally doing. This isn't the time to do some crazy, you know, semi do day fast or something like that. You, know, you don't want to put more stress in your body than it's already undergoing right now. So keep eating what you're normally eating, but you know, high quality that things that we always usually talk about. So really big in seafood for the DHA component of it. DHA essentially is what helps you shuttle energy from your environment to your cells. It helps build that redox potential. High quality protein to feed your muscles. Your muscles are metabolic currency. You need your muscle mass to, <coughs> excuse me, to help you burn your sugars, burn your fats. And for those that haven't heard the story before, my brother, a you know, very fit firefighter, you know, the environment in Jidus last fall, he ended up on a ventilator for about five days. He was very sick. Uh, fortunately, he made a full recovery, but he lost 12 pounds of muscle during the hospitalization. He couldn't walk when he left the hospital. They actually sent him to rehab for a few days before he could get his strength enough that he could go back home. Now he's back to full duty. He's back to playing hockey. He's back to where he was. But if he didn't have that 12 pounds of muscle to lose, he would have been in the hospital a longer period of time. And this is the reason why, you know, if you've ever been in ICU, uh, 
position or you know rounded on the ICU teams, and you see the little 80-year-old lady with no muscle mass, she's not going to do very well. She doesn't have that metabolic you know reserve to repair herself. So if you're young, focus on your muscle mass, and that's the timing of your protein and your resistance training. So kind of switch up you know to um, you know whatever else anybody. Well, I should go back into the treatment. You know, prevention is always the key for COVID. Stay away from other people, especially if they're sick. Um, do the things that deal with your stress, your sleep, your nutrition, your exercise. But if you end up in the hospital with supportive care, um, great. You know, there are drugs that they're trying to evaluate to see if people are going to do better with them. You know, the Gilead drug, Remdesivir, initially was created for Ebola. Um, it basically blocks the viral replication of the virus. Uh, the data on um, the protein and the Zithromax looks like it's basically blocking where the virus enters the cell, the type 2 pneumocyte. That's the cell that makes surfactant. Surfactant is the soapy material that keeps your small uh, airways open. If you lose surfactant, your lungs start collapsing and you basically start drowning on your own secretions. So it might block that receptor where it's coming in. The HIV drug, Kaletra, which I can never remember the two drugs, but they basically block um, the viral proteases. So the virus makes proteins to make its outer capsid and enzymes that it needs. So it needs these proteases, you block the proteases, then they can't build baby viruses. So there's multiple things that are going to potentially be helpful, um, but none of them have been fully like cured yet. Um, and you don't necessarily need to worry about it because the goal is don't ever get to that point where you need it. You know, if you get to the ICU, they're going to have protocols and they're going to know what to do for you. You know, one of the interesting things, I know they did do it in Wuhan, um, and it was high dose IV vitamin C. This is basically based off the Merrick protocol. That was a couple of years ago. I think Merrick came out with the protocol, it had vitamin C, thiamine, and also uh, steroids, corticosteroids. Uh, it was mostly used for bacterial sepsis or shock, and those patients that tended to do better. Um, the doctors who are doing it in New York right now, they just basically cut out the corticosteroids. They just didn't see that that was beneficial. You know, if you kind of hit somebody with a big slug of steroids, you really knock their immune system down. So, you know, the virus might win. So they just think, that, well, if we didn't need the steroids, hit them with a big dose of IV, vitamin C. That helps with the oxidative stress that the body's undergoing. So the body's going to be using up a ton of vitamin C uh, when you're critically ill like that. Taking oral vitamin C right now, is it beneficial? Uh, unknown and maybe you're taking 500 to 1000 milligrams a day it's not going to be a problem but taking a ton of oral vitamin c to try to prevent covid isn't going to be beneficial so you don't want to be experimenting with a bunch of stuff that you're not normally doing because you don't know how your body's going to respond to it if you put a big stress on your body because you took something that you had a reaction to uh, now you're more susceptible to the virus so um but that's basically all i want to kind of do tonight kind of touching on covid and you know the, kind of my heart attack prevention stuff is a little bit on the back burner um, you know, we'll get back into those kind of talks going forward in the future, but, you know, calcium scores, CIMTs, endopaths, you know, those three things are still the key to figuring out who's at risk of a heart attack or not. Um, but we'll get back to those in the future. Um, so now I'll just uh, open it up uh, Q&A style. Uh, anything you guys want to ask, you know, Facebook, Instagram, Zoom, go ahead and ask. Yes. Yes. Oh, so yeah. Sleep apnea. I'm um, asking about it. Yeah. Sleep apnea is uh, extremely common. Um, and if you have a medical uh, issue where you stop breathing at night, uh, you know, you snore, you wake up tired, wake up with headaches. Um, it's extremely stressful to the heart. It raises all these stress hormones, cortisol, adrenaline, raises your blood pressure. That cortisol makes your blood stickier. If your blood's stickier, more likely to clot, higher risk of heart attack. Majority of heart attacks happen between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. with that cortisol surge. So sleep apnea, we test it at home um, in my practice. <clears throat> um, I have a device called the WatchPad. Actually, now I have one that's actually disposable, which is actually pretty beneficial in the COVID issues. Um, you don't have to use something that somebody else has ever touched. But it's basically a watch, um, clips to your finger, measures your heart rate and some different oxygen uh, sensations in your finger. Has a little chest hair watching the rise and fall of your chest and can tell you how many times a minute or an hour you stop breathing and if you're desaturating your oxygen levels are dropping. If you have sleep apnea, that's more than mild, more than likely you're gonna need a face mask, a CPAP or a BiPAP. You know, if it's more mild, you might be able to work with your dentist. They can make a mandibular device sometimes. It just kind of pulls your jaw open, opens up your airway. But definitely sleep, I always ask about every one of my you know, patient encounters. If you're not sleeping well, 
make sure you don't have a medical reason. If you don't sleep well and you don't have apnea, well, then maybe it's just that your circadian rhythms are all jacked up because you're somebody who's inside 90% of the time, you're never seeing the sun, or if you're in front of your technology, you're not protecting your eyes. So it's the, the usual story you hear from me is see the sunrise to reset your circadian rhythm. And when you're inside in front of your things with screens, wear your different blue blocking glasses. All right. Uh, I got a question here. Do you think it would be helpful to start doing long expanding exercises? Um, and I don't know exactly how beneficial it would be. It couldn't hurt. I mean, um, you know, it may also just help with stress relief. Um, but you know, your lung um, capacity is sort of fixed at this point. So don't do anything that's bad to your lung. So if you're smoking, that's really, really bad right now. If you have reduced lung capacity, that's essentially what happens with COVID. Your body starts closing off these real small airways and you have less and less lung capacity. So if you have bad lungs to begin with, you're gonna have a much harder time, you know, not going on the vent. And if you get on the vent, it's gonna be very hard for you to come off of the vent. I got Dr. Lyon still here. What do you want to talk about, Dr. Lyon? Also on Zoom, I do, if you have a chat box, you can type your questions in. You also can now unmute yourself if you want, if you want to ask a question. Mike, I'll ask one. And pull her on mute. Oh, sorry about that. Anyway, um, I was going to ask about uh, oral vitamin D. Would you increase your intake of oral vitamin D or just try to get out in the sun a lot more? Or some combination of both? Good question. Questions about oral vitamin D. Um, you know, the, the answer is always going to be get out in the sun is always going to be the answer right now. You know, the sun has the right wavelengths of light to set your circadian rhythms for the day. About midday, you're going to be able to make uh, vitamin D on your skin. You know, vitamin D is associated with how well your immune system's working. Your T regulator cells get programmed by sunlight. So popping a vitamin D pill does not program your immune system the same way that sunlight does. And you know, if your vitamin D level is 10, yeah, maybe you're going to supplement right now, but the goal is that you, know, you don't want to uncouple your body's ability to make vitamin D naturally. So if you're popping vitamin D, you still need to be out in the sun to actually sulfate it and turn it on in the skin. So currently, I'm not taking oral vitamin D. If I was to start coming down with COVID, I probably would short-term take a bunch of it, high doses, but that's only if I already knew that I was infected. Uh, let's see. Uh, question about what's the most interesting thing I've read lately? Um, I read this, you know, it's, it's still about uh, like photobiomodulation stuff. So I'm really kind of a light cardiologist. So right now I'm wearing this uh, Weber medical laser watch. This thing's pretty awesome. Some people can see the little color shooting out from under it. But right now it has red, blue, green, and yellow light going into the radial and the ulnar artery. Um, a couple months ago, I did that uh, IV red laser. The company that made this device has an article that they sent me and I actually sent on their uh, Instagram page as well. Um, it wasn't using their exact device, but it was just using something similar. And they were testing it directly on blood. And they were using Ebola, which Ebola wasn't as transmissible as COVID, um, but was highly lethal. So if you got Ebola, you had about a 50% chance you were gonna die from it. But you were so sick, there was no way you were gonna go out and spread it to a bunch of other people. So that's why the kind of Ebola things was were just very uh, situated to one country, maybe two at most. But they had an article that they had uh, shown that they were able to reduce the viral counts extremely low using uh, UV irradiation. Um, so this company that makes this thing makes the uh, intravenous laser. They have a 312 nanometer UV uh, laser diode. <clears throat> They're not going to get approved to uh, 
you know, use it in the hospitals. But if I was starting to come down with COVID symptoms, I have a friend in St. Louis, I'd be showing up at her office. She can already do all the IV vitamin C. So I'd get a big dose of IV vitamin C and then I would plug into the uh, DEV laser. And it's not that it's gonna necessarily completely quote, zap the virus, but it's going to um, knock down some of the viral load and it will basically, you know, like a better term, supercharge your immune system to make your immune system, okay, I need to go take a care of, you know, what's going on in the system. So um, I would do some IV red laser and IV uh, UV laser if I knew I was coming down with more of a mild case. My whole goal is, you know, I'm gonna wait for as long as possible before I would show up at a hospital. <clears throat> because if you don't have COVID now when you go to the hospital, you're almost for surely going to catch it when you're at the hospital. Um, so, you know, everybody's gotta to listen to themselves and know kind of what their uh, pain threshold is gonna be for saying, hey, I can't take it anymore. But, you know, I think one good test would be, you know, if you have a pulse ox at home, measure your pulse ox, and if your pulse ox is getting down to like 93%, you might need to be go get checked in, uh, at the hospital for that or call these respiratory centers. Um, or if you're speaking to somebody and you really have more kind of breathlessness, that's probably a more sensitive sign than saying, oh, can you hold your breath for 10 seconds? That's probably not too sensitive to saying uh, that there's something going on in the lungs. But great question. All right, here's a question. Do we need to shower after being outside, getting the vitamin D to wash out the virus that we're now being told is in the air? No, um, somebody actually asked uh, Jack Cruz this the other day, uh, kind of a split question was that no, uh, you do not need to wash your skin to uh, optimize vitamin D production on your skin. Um, you know, now the virus, if it's actually, you know, if you're outside in full spectrum sun, the virus is not gonna last very long outside in UV light. It's, you know, the virus is about 500 times more sensitive to UV light than a uh, human cell is. So, you know, yes, the virus could live for a while outside the body, you know, on plastic and cardboard and stuff like that. But if stuff's outside, it's gonna be dead within an hour most likely. So, um, you know, unless you're walking through a hospital and keep people are coughing, sneezing on you, if you're just outside, you don't need to go inside to have to wash your skin off. But um, for the people who might be medical providers that are in the hospital, yeah, you would basically wanna pretend like if you've ever been outside and you're coming back into your house, that you are radioactive. So strip off all the clothes, everything, try to wash off outside in the garage, go directly uh, inside, clean up, Nothing that you wore ever gets into uh, contact with anybody else in your house. So, uh, good question. I've read a report that people with type O blood do better than uh, people with type A. Um, any truth to this? Yes. Um, it's also true with um, malaria. And I don't know exactly the, the pathophys why that is, um, but uh, that has been shown. And I think this may be plausible why possibly uh, the Italians are doing worse than the Chinese on their mortality is that they probably had more type A blood there. Um, and essentially it means that uh, you need to do better to boost up your immune system. Not necessarily taking a bunch of supplements, but you probably need more sun to build up your immune system. So um, you know, I'm not breaking HIPAA because I'm talking about myself. I have type A blood. So am I worried about it for myself? Not tremendously, but um, you know, I just know what I need to do. I need to be outside more. Um, the other thing is men, more than women, tend to have more of these ACE2 receptors. So men tend to do worse than women. So if you're a man with type A blood, that might be a little bit more concerning to some people. Um, question, have I heard when the projected time that this will peak in St. Louis? Um, nobody knows for sure. Um, yeah, we're still a week or two behind what's going on in New York. Um, so it'll be probably sometime mid-April, late April when the kind of the peak of the uh, infections hit, the peak of the deaths will be after that point. Um, you know, it was just really last week that they really started testing a lot more in, in the third. Um, I know we had like a 600% increase in, you know, cases uh, week over week, but that's just mostly a function of um, testing more people. Ultimately, they're going to have to be able to test um, everybody. You know, yes, you want to test somebody and say, do you currently have it? That's going to be great. And I saw that Abbott just came out with the test that they should have the answer within like five to 15 minutes and they're gonna start rolling these tests up this week apparently. So that's gonna be awesome. Um, but the better test that we all wanna know is <clears throat> if you've been exposed and maybe had a asymptomatic case or a very mild case, I didn't have to even seek you know, medical care um, and recover on your own, you know, that's when the, the serologic testing will be able to tell that. So we'll be able to take your blood, see has your body made antibodies towards this. There's suspicion that if that's true, you're likely going to be immune to COVID for at least this year. 
but it could be like the flu where you know you're only immune for a short period of time and then the virus mutates and then you're not necessarily going to be immune next year um it's very plausible that COVID is going to speak you know spike right now in the spring and the summer with the uv light coming out almost all coronaviruses naturally they're less uh, intense in the summer times the uv kind of knocks them down the ball comes around we'll likely have another surge um, but if enough people have been infected and recovered then there's possibility that they could use some um, convalescent serum to treat people. So Mount Sinai in New York is already doing this. This was done and successfully, not nearly as uh, technologically advanced in the 1918 flu. People that they recovered, they took the blood, spun it down, took out the plasma, put it in somebody who was sick, those people tended to do better. For now it would be that if somebody's recovered, they would take the plasma, they could give it to one really sick person in the ICU. The other thing they could do is they could split the blood into like five milliliter aliquots. They could give it to the first line, you know, responders, you know, EMS, nurses, docs, and that would provide some immunity to them for a couple of weeks. So they would need to keep continually getting boosters of that. This is going to be very exciting if this really pans out the way hopefully it will. Um, but they need to be able to get that blood testing set up to let the people know who's been exposed and who's recovered. Because if you've recovered from this already, even if it's a mild case, you potentially could go back to work. You know, especially if you're a healthcare provider, you wouldn't be as nearly concerned if you've already recovered and had antibodies towards this. So we'll be able to build the economy back up once we know this testing is out there and available. And we won't have to lock everybody down. You know, it's plausible that yes, New York's gonna be locked down for a while because they have you know the lion's share of the cases. But you know, middle of nowhere, Missouri, you know, has five cases, maybe that town doesn't need to be locked down for nearly as long. And you know or they go back on lockdown once their caseload starts spiking up. They may just have to use the metric of, you know, how many ICUs are full at that point. You know, I looked up the data the other week, you know, there's 777 ICUs in St. Louis. Um, you know, I don't know percentage right now, and they're not gonna really share this data, is how many of them are 100% full right now? Nobody knows. You know, um, I don't have privy to that information, and, you know, I'm not gonna be, uh, uh, you know, running around the ICUs counting up the people right now myself. Um, but you know, if there's 777 ICUs and we're using half capacity, okay, well maybe people can go out in the community. But if we're at 100% capacity or 150% capacity, no, we need to kind of socially isolate right now because we can't tolerate any more super sick people. All right, let's see, all right. Uh, yeah, the question, can somebody get the antibody test yet? Other than that Mount Sinai, not that I know of, um, you know, there's possibly, if you're a healthcare worker, maybe your hospital that you work at might be able to do it, but uh, it's not commercially available to the general public yet. Um, yeah, this is a little bit more, uh, I can't practice medicine over the internet type of question. Um, but uh, the question is basically, you know, if I came down with, you know, uh, the virus, I would be taking higher, higher dose oral vitamin D. Um, how much do I take and how frequently? I can't really answer that question in this kind of public forum. But, um, you know, a classic high dose is considered anything over 10,000 units a day. Um, but use the uh, D-Minder app. It's free. It tells you what time of day to be outside to build your vitamin D. If you've had a blood level, you plug in your blood level. You tell it what time of day you're out, how much skin's exposed. It'll give you an idea of how many IUs and uh, minutes you're making, and also tell you ballpark what your blood level of vitamin D would be. I would be shooting for a vitamin D level of 60 without supplementation. Uh, Good question. For stress reduction, in addition to meditation exercise, what are your thoughts on supplements such as magnesium or caffeine reduction? Um, less is more in this situation. So caffeine reduction for sure. Have I personally done that? Uh, no, I'm probably worse off right now because you know, I'm doing telemedicine, so I tend to drink more coffee right now. Um, not saying that's the right thing to do for myself, um, but I have actually uh, tested my uh, um, cytochromes. I know I'm a fast metabolizer of caffeine. Um, so I can get burned it off faster. I know I sleep well, you know, but if caffeine is affecting your sleep quality right now, you can definitely need to, to cut back on the caffeine. Magnesium, you know, 
I'm plus minus. I wouldn't take more of it if you're not taking it right now, but um, you want to do things a little bit more naturally right now because you don't want to push your body over the edge on something and then your body, you know, they come out. I'm not, this is completely like speculation. Like, you know, I seriously doubt this would happen, but like, you know, they say like, oh, the virus loves magnesium and it grows faster because people are taking more magnesium. You don't want to be that person. Um, question, how do people with mild asthma fare with COVID? Um, apparently they're not doing as well as expected. It wasn't that asthma was supposed to be a big uh, um, confounder. It's supposed to be heart disease, lung disease, cancer, diabetes, hypertension. Those are the people that do worse in addition to people you know, 60 and above and especially over 80. Um, but the people with asthmatics, um, they tend to end up getting more, uh, more uh, difficulty getting off the ventilator. All right, welcome to a couple more people on Instagram here. Thanks for joining. And we were I'm recording this, so uh, the Instagram Live will be back up uh, when we're done with this. And I'm filming this on Zoom. I'll put it up on my YouTube channel, Michael Kleiman MD. Uh, for any of those that haven't uh, known who I am just yet, I'm Dr. Michael Kleiman, heart attack prevention expert, and a biohacker health optimizer. And tonight we're talking about COVID-19, heart attack prevention, and any biohacking topics you're interested in. Um, so back to the question here, if you have other illnesses like high blood pressure, lung disease, what are your chances of surviving with coronavirus? Um, I just saw some numbers today. It's still mostly that the heart disease is the worst, you know, about 10% of the people who have heart disease, you know, you've had heart attacks, bypass, you know, valve disease, you know, you get COVID, um, you have about 10% mortality risk in some of those instances. Um, you know, your body's just more prone to the it. Uh, your body's not gonna be, you know, as uh, strong of a fighter if, you, if your body has a weak heart pump, you know. Um, you know, it's not a, this was an earlier series of data, but it was like, you know, lungs are the number one thing getting affected by COVID, but about a third of the time the heart gets affected. Sometimes it's myocarditis, an infection of the heart. Um, so you have heart lungs going down that are weak to begin with. Um, those people just tend to not to do as well. Your questions, everybody. Keep them coming. Thank you for the happy doctor's day. Um, can I explain vitamin D sun LDL connection? So um, the way Mother Nature intended it, um, cholesterol was not put in your system um, to give you heart attacks. You know, every cell in your body uses cholesterol. You make your outer shells with cholesterol. You make your sex hormones with cholesterol, you make your biases digest your fats. Um, so, you know, cholesterol is not good or bad. It's just if the cholesterol gets oxidized or damaged, then you're going to start having a problem. When you oxidize your cholesterol, your body now thinks it's bacteria. You send out your immune system to go attack the bacteria. If your immune system goes crazy, your arteries end up getting damaged as innocent bystanders. But vitamin D is a hormone. It's made from cholesterol, LDL, C, LDL cholesterol, it's basically cholesterol that comes from your liver. About 70 to 80% of your cholesterol is made in your liver. The rest of it, you get it in your diet or you're recycling it through your gut. But cholesterol gets sulfated into vitamin D. So as the sun hits your skin, you will do a reaction that will turn that cholesterol into vitamin D ultimately. Good question. Uh, question. It seems like there are multiple stories about people taking a turn for the worse very quickly once they get to the hospital. Why is the decline so rapid? Um, it's that, you know, they go into um, acute respiratory distress, uh, and that's, you know, bad enough. But there's stories that, you know, these people are having uh, multi-organ system failure. Their kidneys fail. They need dialysis. Um, you know, their heart starts failing. They need, you know, mechanical support. Um, and Possibly the other thing too is that, you know, once you're in the hospital, you're just exposed to a bunch of other people that have it. And it's the viral load in some instances. So, you know, say example, your viral loads, and this isn't the real number, but your viral loads two, now you're in the hospital exposed to 20 other people that have it. Now your viral loads hundred, you have a much bigger problem than if you were just at home with this issue. But again, if you're short of breath, you can't breathe, you need to go get checked out because you might ultimately need a ventilator for some short-term support. But um, but that has been pretty much the story is that once you're on the ventilator, it usually does not go well. I've seen most studies, you know, up to 90% of people don't get off the vent. Sometimes 30% of people are getting off the vent. 
Um, so the whole goal is try not to get the hospital. You know, get your sleep, get your sunlight, deal with your stress, eat your seafood, do anything possible not to end up in the hospital. Uh, question, is it true that AVA will make the coronavirus worse? Not necessarily clear. Um, France kind of put out that warning and the WHO initially said yes, you know, avoid all non-steroidals and they kind of backed that down a little bit. Um, but, you know, it's more the kind of the theory is that, you know, your body, you know, still pretty much the number one symptom of this um, is high fevers. Um, you know, yes, I know it's now more common that people who have more mild cases um, are just having the anosmia where they can't smell or taste. That's the virus directly infecting nerves that, you know, go up to the brain. Um, so, yes, if you can't all of a sudden smell or taste something, it could be allergies, but, you know, Occam's razor, you know, what's the most likely thing? Potentially you're exposing yourself, getting exposed to COVID, you need to self-isolate from your family and friends. Even if you're already doing, you know, stay at home. You need to stay in your own bedroom and not be hanging out with your family members if this starts hitting you at home. Um, but, you know, the fever is your body's, response that, you know, you send out that you have the immune system warriors, the cytokines and all these things to go fight the virus. Viruses don't like high temperatures. So your body raises temperature to try to, to kill the virus. So, you know, you don't want to blunt that, you know, that febrile response all the time. You know, if you have to take something, maybe you would take a little bit of Tylenol, but not too much. You take too much Tylenol, you block glutathione, your, your body's production of glutathione. That's the body's master antioxidant. So, if you can tolerate it, it's better to kind of ride the fevers out, but you can use cool towels, take cool showers, you know, do something that kind of brings it down a little bit. But, um, you know, if you took one Advil, not a problem, but if you're trying to pop Advil every six hours, uh, that can cause an issue long-term. You can damage your kidneys for sure doing that. Um, you know, so I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be pounding the Advil or any of the non steroidals right now. Uh, that's most likely, yes. So somebody has a question, you know, if their oxygen saturation is typically 96, 97, would the warning levels stay around 92? That's a ballpark. If anybody, you know, 92 or below, um, that means they're having issues. So, um, you know, if your lips start turning blue, you know, if you're speaking in sentences like this and you're taking a lot of breaths, then that's more problematic, um, you know, especially when it's more acute. Anybody have a live question they want to ask tonight? for any other questions to come in and you know i'll just start uh, kind of my wrapping up uh, kind of speech um so thank you for joining me tonight um you know i'm hopefully going to be able to uh, keep doing these a couple times a week as you know the demand is there for you guys you know i want to offer you whatever help i can during these times so if i can't see you in the office right now you know always reach out to me or cassie online we can make sure things are okay from a heart standpoint but if you have questions about how to you know do things for you know, better health optimization for COVID or, you know, the biohacking question, you know, what classes do I get? Always happy to answer those things for you guys. Um, the, uh, they're asking about the COVID-19 testing kits in St. Louis. Yeah, it really ramped up last week. Um, you know, if you just go to the um, St. Louis Health Department's website, they have the, kind of the, the phone numbers on it where you can call to get the testing, but um, all the, the major hospital systems have kind of collaborated together. Um, you know, Mercy has a couple of these drive-through clinics. Um, I know the other hospital systems are doing it as well. So that's probably the best way to do it is if you, um, you know, you have to call ahead. They do still do a screening process. Um, so as far as I know, it's still not ubiquitous testing. It's just not that anybody wants one can get the test. They still have to have some symptoms or exposure. Um, 
but then if you get tested, in my mind, it'd be best to do it in your car so that you're not exposing a bunch of other people. So drive yourself to the testing center, no family members or friends in the car with you, go get swabbed, drive home. Yeah, but, and as for the testing, I know uh, it will be important to test people to know if they have it, but the more important testing ultimately is going to be when they have the serologic testing for the antibodies. Everybody's going to need that because you need to know you're immune to it or once and if they can create a successful immunization, okay, you'll know you're somebody who needs to get the immunization. And I know there's multiple companies trying to come out with uh, a vaccine. You know, they're trying many novel ways. I saw somebody who's actually some French scientists are trying to uh, repurpose the, uh, the measles vaccine. Um, you know, if they can figure that out, then there's already multiple uh, labs that already know how to process the measles vaccine. So that'd be kind of a jump start on it. But still, uh, a lightning fast type of immunization is probably still a year, 18 months away. So. Well, uh, if there's no more questions coming in, I'll start wrapping it up tonight. I will uh, put this meeting up on YouTube uh, later tonight. My website is uh, apollocardiology.com. You know, that's the way, best way to get in touch with me. You can book an appointment if you like. I'm doing 100% telemedicine business right now. I definitely have some availability if you guys wanna uh, do a one-on-one -on -one consult with me. Um, and then, uh, my next scheduled one of these is going to be on Friday at noon central time. Um, it'll be the same format. Um, mostly we'll be focusing on um, just kind of updates for the week, but if there's a specific topic somebody wants me to address, I'll address it at that time. So um, thank you guys for uh, attending tonight and take care of yourselves. And if you need anything, just uh, give us a holler. Take care. Good night.